Climate science is complicated, but the most important thing people need to understand about climate change can be summarized in just 10 words. Here's what we would say are the five key ideas that we think are, are critical that everybody can start with at least. And that is uh, five key beliefs in just 10 words. It's real. It's us. It's bad. The experts agree. And there's hope. Okay, That's it. These are the five key climate beliefs developed by Ed Maybeck. His research found that while there are a whole range of concepts and attitudes about climate change, the most important were these five key beliefs. Climate change is happening. Humans are causing it. There's expert agreement on these first two points. The impacts will be bad, but we can solve climate change. If those messages were all the public ever heard about climate change, we'd be in a lot better shape now. But there's a lot of misinformation about climate change too. You don't believe global warming is real. You've said so. It's just sunspot activity. Um, in the opinion of about 32,000 of the world's leading scientists, yes. The 97% figure that's thrown around, the head of the UN I I IPC said that number was pulled out of thin air. There is not one piece of empirical evidence anywhere, anywhere, showing that humans cause through their carbon dioxide production affect any in any way climate. It's all about money. I mean, what would happen to the Weather Channel's ratings if all of a sudden people weren't scared anymore? Climate misinformation features a whole range of arguments, but you can group all these arguments into five main categories. Global warming isn't happening. Humans aren't causing it. The experts are unreliable. Climate impacts won't be bad. And we can't solve climate change. I call them the five climate disbeliefs. To effectively respond to misinformation, we need to understand it. So let's dig deeper into the five climate disbeliefs. This is based on my research with Travis Cohen and Constantine Busalis. Over the last few years, we trained a machine to automatically detect different categories of climate misinformation. We used this to build a history of climate misinformation over the last two decades. I'll come back to this later. Before we start, a warning. The first time I gave this talk was to communication undergrads, and they looked shell-shocked afterwards. This was their first introduction to the world of climate denial, and I threw them in at the deep end. Having been immersed in the world of climate denial for over a decade, I didn't realize how much of a shock to the system it would be to the uninitiated. So before we deep dive into the dark, disturbing world of climate denial, let me remind you, there is good in the world. There are puppies. We have baby Yoda. So hang on to those positive thoughts as we dive in. The first climate disbelief is the myth that global warming isn't happening. I don't believe climate change is real. I think this is global warming hysteria and alarmism. So-called global warming, which isn't happening. Global warming is illusory. We're actually going through a period of global cooling. Denial of the basic existence of global warming has been remarkably consistent. In fact, on climate denial blogs, it's on the relative increase. They're doubling down on their belief that global warming isn't happening. This is despite the fact that global warming indicators are seen all over our climate system. Signs of warming are not just from thermometers measuring surface warming. We see it in ocean warming, melting cryosphere, rising sea levels, migrating species, shifting seasons, even the changing structure of the atmosphere. To deny global warming means denying all these different indicators of warming. The cryosphere, parts of the world where water is frozen, is melting from the Arctic and Greenland in the north to the Antarctic ice sheets in the south and many glaciers in between. We see misinformation about all the different parts of the cryosphere, questioning whether Antarctica and Greenland is losing ice, casting doubt on whether Arctic sea ice is collapsing, and pointing to growing glaciers to argue that the world's glaciers are fine. Another denialist argument is, why are you worried about global warming? You should be more worried about global cooling. In his book, Climatology vs. Pseudoscience, Dana Nicitelli documents the long history of climate deniers predicting that global cooling is just around the corner, and how consistently their predictions have been proven wrong by ongoing warming. Every winter we hear people say, it's cold, whatever happened to global warming? We keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record. I asked the chair, you know what this is? It's a snowball, and that's just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out, very unseasonal. So here, Mr. President, catch this. Mm -hmm. This is our Fox News global warming alert for you. It is freezing. Blizzard versus global warming. Who do you believe, Al Gore or your freezing butt? Another storm could be headed this way next week. 
global warming, where are you? We want you back. While this argument is obviously flawed based on anecdotal thinking, surveys have found that people show lower belief in global warming if they fill out the survey on cooler days. Our beliefs are subtly influenced by our experiences. Sea level rise is one of the clearest signals of global warming. Just about every year is the highest sea level on record. This record is broken so regularly that record high sea level is unremarkable. No one even mentions it. So denying sea level rise is difficult and requires some creativity. As the ice melts, the volume does not increase of the ice water combination. And so none of the water will spill out. And that makes sense if you realize that as the water melts, its density increases because it's turning back into liquid water. So we'll just let it sit there for a while. Okay, so here the ice is gone and we've got no spillage whatsoever. One approach is to move the goalposts and argue that sea level rise isn't accelerating. Another approach is to cherry pick specific locations where sea level rise isn't as clear. One of the key ways that climate change impacts people is through weather events like heat waves, flooding, drought and hurricanes getting more extreme. But it can be difficult to detect the signal in extreme weather data. This is a statistical uncertainty that deniers exploit by arguing that extreme weather isn't increasing or that it can't be linked to climate change. They say that we had hurricanes that were far worse than what we just had with Michael. Who says that? They say. You mean well, the people, people say. The people say that in the... Yeah, but what about the scientists who say it's worse than ever? Uh, a surprisingly persistent myth is that surface temperatures stopped warming over the last decade or so otherwise known as the hiatus. This argument originated after 1998, which was the hottest year on record at the time due to an unusually warm El Nino. 2005 surpassed 1998 to become the hottest year on record. Five years later, 2010 surpassed 2005. All that got blown out of the water when 2014, 2015 and 2016 saw the hottest year record broken three years in a row. That didn't stop Scott Pruitt arguing in 2017 that there was a hiatus in warming. Why are the hottest temperatures in the last decade uh, essentially the hottest temperatures that we've seen on record? We've actually been in a hiatus, we've actually been in a hiatus since, since the late 1990s, but, 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 you know. Another rhetorical argument used to cast doubt on global warming is the claim that scientists stopped using the term global warming and instead switched to climate change presumably because global warming had stalled. A number of studies now showing there has been no global warming over at least the last 10 years and that the earth is actually cooling now. Environmentalists are looking to rebrand their message. Well, if it gets warm or cold, we'll just call it climate change and blame people. Obviously, global warming hasn't stalled. And scientists have used both terms for decades. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was formed way back in 1988. Those are some of the main arguments used to deny the reality of global warming. The second climate disbelief is that humans aren't causing global warming. There is no man-made climate change. They say right. man-made climate change is real. And we don't know how much man did. So do I think that man has impacted climate change? I do. But to what degree the jury is still out on that. Arguing that global warming isn't human caused is less prevalent than arguments that global warming isn't happening. My speculation is because the arguments are more complicated. Nevertheless, they are a steady presence in denial blogs. One of these arguments focus on the carbon cycle, arguing that humans aren't responsible for the rise in atmospheric CO2. The most common myth used to support this argument is that human CO2 emissions are tiny compared to natural CO2 emissions ignoring the fact that natural CO2 emissions are matched by natural CO2 absorptions. If one concedes that humans are causing the rise in atmospheric CO2, the next argument is that the increase in CO2 is not causing global warming. A number of myths focus on the greenhouse effect, arguing that the extra CO2 in the atmosphere can't be causing warming. One myth argues that CO2 is just a trace gas, only 0.04% of the atmosphere. This is despite the fact that we know from everyday experience that active substances in tiny amounts can have a strong effect. They claim that the greenhouse effect is saturated and adding more CO2 won't make any difference. Interestingly, this was one of the first arguments against human-caused global warming made by Angstrom at the start of the 20th century. They cite ice core records showing that CO2 rose after warming in the past, thinking this disproves the greenhouse effect. 
In reality, it's evidence for the reinforcing feedback that pulled the Earth out of ice ages. They point out that water vapor has a stronger greenhouse effect than CO2, so CO2 can't be causing global warming. Ironically, they're misinterpreting even more evidence for reinforcing feedback. They falsely argue that because scientists have struggled to find a hot spot in the mid troposphere, a pattern predicted by climate models from any type of warming, that this disproves the warming effect of CO2. And lastly, they point to past periods where CO2 was higher than current levels to argue that the world didn't boil back then, so CO2 can't have a warming effect now. The idea that the Earth has never had high CO2 levels, it's completely false. Most of the time, it's never had such low levels as we have now. This ignores the fact that the sun was also significantly cooler back then. If you look at the curve of CO2 going back 500 million years, to the Cambrian period, and you look at the curve of temperature, they are almost never in correlation. They are mostly out of sync with each other. That's because as you go back 500 million years, the sun also goes cooler. When you combine the sun and CO2, then they are in correlation. No, they're not. I'll, 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 I'll go up against my, with my graphs any day with you. Another common way to cast down on human-caused global warming is to blame natural causes. Natural variability, in my opinion, is still the primary driver. The sun has been a popular alternative explanation. Solar cycles have a lot more to do with climate change on this planet than do CO2 emission and global warming. The warming is due to the sun. This is challenging given sun and climate have been going in opposite directions for the last few decades of global warming. Another myth blames modern global warming on geological forces. Volcanoes are the most common suggestion. Despite the fact that volcanoes have had a cooling influence on climate over the last few decades, ocean cycles do have a strong influence on short-term climate. So there are a popular alternative explanation for modern global warming. Do you believe CO2 is the primary control knob for the temperature of the Earth and for, uh, for climate? No, most likely the primary control knob is the um, uh, ocean waters and the, uh, this environment that we live in. The problem is all ocean cycles do is move heat around. They don't add any extra heat to the climate system. What we've been seeing for decades is a steady buildup in heat in our oceans, which can't be explained by ocean cycles. They can only be explained by an external factor causing the planet to accumulate extra heat. One of the most common arguments against human-caused global warming is pointing at natural climate change in the Earth's past. Senator Rubio, the Miami mayor, has endorsed you. Will you honor his request for a pledge and acknowledge the reality of the scientific consensus of climate well, change and pledge to do something sure, about it? Sure, the climate is changing. And one of the reasons why the climate is changing is because the climate has always been changing. There has never been a time when the climate has not changed. I mean, of course climate change is real. Climate changes. The climate's been changing forever and it will always change. The climate is changing. The climate has always changed. The climate always will change. There's never been a time when the climate hasn't been changing. The climate has always changed. Who denies that climate changes? You know, you have to be completely blind to deny that. The logic is that if natural factors caused climate change before, the natural factors must be causing climate change now. This logic is flawed, committing the single cause fallacy. The third climate disbelief involves attacks on climate experts and climate science claiming they're unreliable. The most striking result from our machine learning research was that attacks on climate experts and climate science was by far the most common form of misinformation. In contrast, there's a dearth of research into countering ad hominem attacks on scientists. Climate science is one target of attack. First and foremost, casting doubt on the scientific consensus about human-caused global warming is a key denialist strategy. Well, they say, well, it's beyond that now. Everybody agrees, but they don't agree that it's a crisis or that we can do anything about it. Climate deniers have known for years that casting doubt on the scientific consensus reduces public support for climate action. If the public is told that there's still debate and uncertainty on this, public support for their agenda just evaporates. Um, focus group meetings show that all the time. We see the same focus group results that the other side looks at. And any time you say, well, some scientists disagree, boom, half of the people in the room say, oh, wait a minute. You know, this isn't gospel truth. This isn't religion. This has been confirmed by many psychological studies which find that public perception of the scientific consensus on climate change is a gateway belief. When people realize experts agree on human-caused global warming, 
their acceptance of climate change increases, which has the flow-on effect of increasing support for climate action. So keeping the public confused about the level of expert agreement has been one of the main goals of climate deniers. Proxies are another target of attack. Climate scientists use proxies, like tree rings and ice cores, to reconstruct past climate before the instrumental record. Climate proxies have produced iconic graphs like the hockey stick, which tells a clear story of human influence on climate. The powerful impact of the hockey stick graph is why proxies have been a focus of climate misinformation. The temperature record is one of the most used data sets for communicating global warming, and consequently is also much attacked. Casting doubt on the reliability of thermometer data usually takes the form of photos showing weather stations positioned near heat sources like car parks or air conditioners. These types of anecdotal arguments ignore the statistical work done to remove biases from the temperature record. Climate models are an indispensable tool for climate scientists in understanding our climate, particularly in predicting future climate change. They predict severe climate impacts from our greenhouse gas emissions and unsurprisingly are regularly attacked. The main form of criticism is claiming their predictions fail to match observations and therefore are unreliable. But historically, climate models have done a good job predicting future warming. This is a stark contrast with denialist predictions of global cooling, showing what happens when predictions are based on wishful thinking rather than physics. The next category of attacks are on climate experts and other people involved in climate change. One framing we often see is characterizing the climate movement as a religion. This is ironic, given the climate movement is based on science, while climate denial is driven by ideology. We're on the cusp, perhaps as a nation, of sacrificing our prosperity to the volcano god of climate change. It is their religion. They want to fight the weather. Uh, the rest of us want to deal with real threats uh, that want to take away our freedoms. It's the new religion of the left. Man pollutes, man's carbon, uh, greedy industries. This has to hurt people. We have to fight this. This is their religion. The mainstream media are a major source of climate information for the general public. So they are often criticized by climate deniers when they publish accurate content consistent with climate science. Politicians advancing climate policy are a regular target of ad hominem attacks. Environmentalists are also prominent advocates for climate action and receive a lot of attacks. This includes former politicians like Al Gore. You don't go see Joseph Goebbels' films to see the truth about Nazi Germany. You don't want to go see Al Gore's film to see the truth about global warming. Lastly, climate scientists are a constant target of attacks. Ad hominem attacks on climate scientists take different forms, like accusing them of fabricating data, or lacking competence. But the most common form of ad hominems directed at scientists are bias attacks, accusing scientists of being alarmist or politically motivated. But what about Nine? the scientists who say it's worse than ever? Uh, you'd have to show me the scientists because they have a very big political agenda. If somebody controls your energy and the way you use energy, they control you. They control your life, and that's what this issue has always been about. Conspiracy theories are an integral part of climate denial. In fact, you see conspiracy theories in every movement that denies a scientific consensus. Often, attacks on climate scientists are accompanied with conspiracy theories. It's a hoax. A total hoax. It's an outrageous lie. So Obama's talking about all of this with the global warming and that. A lot of it's a hoax. It's a hoax. I mean, it's a money-making industry, okay? It's a hoax. A lot of it. But remember, the researchers have an incentive to say, this is a crisis, and if we do this, it'll make it better, because then they get money. If they yeah. say, we don't know, or it might not make a difference, they don't get money. Scientists behave as a herd, especially when you throw uh, millions and millions and billions of dollars of taxpayer money on them to come up with an answer. So everybody is going to act the same. The fourth climate disbelief involves downplaying climate impacts. Some arguments focus on climate sensitivity, which is the amount of global warming if we double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If there were no climate feedbacks, the direct warming from doubled CO2 would be around 1 degree Celsius. Scientists expect that reinforcing feedback, such as increased water vapor and melting sea ice, will roughly triple this direct warming. So our best estimate of climate sensitivity is around 3 degrees Celsius. But misinformation about climate sensitivity claims that it's much lower than 3 degrees, arguing that reinforcing feedbacks aren't so strong. Another climate myth is that a few degrees of global warming is no problem, as we see more than that just over a single day's weather. But comparing local temperature change to the global average is like comparing apples to oranges. 
Just a few degrees of global warming from the last ice age to the current warm period resulted in around 100 meters of sea level rise. Warming the whole planet involves building up a huge amount of heat, which disrupts our climate in many devastating ways. Climate deniers downplay the many climate impacts on animal and plant species. Animals are migrating towards cooler climates, and we're even seeing tree lines shifting in response to climate change. Downplaying the impact of climate change on species takes several forms. One is that animals can adapt to climate change. Of course, we've seen throughout Earth's history that when climate changed faster than animals' capacity to adapt, the planet suffered a mass extinction event. The evidence is building that we're currently in a sixth mass extinction event. Polar bears are an iconic symbol of climate impacts, from magazine covers to Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. A new scientific study shows that for the first time they're finding polar bears that have actually drowned swimming long distances, up to 60 miles, to find the ice. And they didn't find that before. Like all iconic climate symbols, they've been a target of climate misinformation, arguing that polar bears are thriving during global warming. This is an oversimplification. Different factors affect polar bear populations, such as hunting, which has reduced over the last few decades. Oceans are highly impacted by climate change in various ways. For example, corals are being hit with a one-two punch bleaching from warming waters, and acidification from extra CO2 being absorbed by the ocean. Ocean acidification and bleaching are being downplayed even as we're seeing damage to ocean systems happening across the globe. Another argument downplaying climate impacts is that CO2 is not a pollutant. Calling carbon dioxide a pollutant? Come on. <laughs> Look how much pollution I just put out. CO2 is not a pollutant. This often takes the form of arguing that CO2 is plant food, as plants absorb CO2 in order to grow. Carbon dioxide is a perfectly natural gas. It's just like water vapor. It's something that plants love. They grow better with more carbon dioxide. And you can see the greening of the earth already from uh, the additional carbon dioxide mm. in the atmosphere. Of course, this ignores the fact that plants also need a healthy temperature range and regular water supply both of which are disrupted by climate change. The fifth climate disbelief argues that climate solutions won't work. There is nothing we can do to stop whatever the weather is gonna do. We can't make it warmer, we can't make it colder. Is anything we do now gonna make any significant difference? And there, no, I, I am a denier because we're just wasting money and hurting poor people doing the stuff we did under President Obama. This myth is of growing importance, as we're seeing a relative increase in misinformation about climate solutions. We can expect that over time, as science denial becomes more untenable, solutions denial will become more of a go-to strategy for groups trying to delay climate action. The first type of solutions denial argues that climate policies are ineffective. This can take several forms. One is that markets are a more efficient way of tackling climate change and other proposed solutions like government regulation of fossil fuel pollution. This market-based argument is a reflection of the main drivers of climate denial, political ideology and affiliation. Specifically, the political belief in small governments and free unregulated markets. Another way to downplay the efficacy of climate policy is to argue it'll have a negligible impact on global temperature. Typically, this takes the form of picking a single climate policy and calculating how much warming it will prevent. If everybody followed the Paris Agreement, which they wouldn't have, even the proponents admit it would only make the slightest difference. If we drop our emissions to zero today, Zero, zero, zero. And keep them there, please. Today, do 2100. it right now. No dry, no, how much? No, more, no more emissions to 2100. Okay. The Earth's surface temperature, according to those models that are too hot anyway, we would only save 14 hundredths of a degree of warming. You can't measure 14 hundredths of a degree of warming. Oh, you'd make yourself really poor, but you wouldn't change the climate. Of course, a single policy won't have a big impact. It takes a suite of policies from all countries to add up to significant climate impact. This myth is like arguing that the first step won't take you out of the way of an approaching truck, so you might as well not move at all. Related to this is another climate myth. One country is only a small fraction of the world's emissions, so there's no point acting. Again, it takes all the world's countries working together to solve climate change. If every country made this argument, we'd never address climate change. Following on from this is the argument that there's no point reducing our country's emissions because of China's emissions. Again, climate action requires global cooperation. 
the whole reason why the International Paris Climate Agreement was so significant. Connected to the argument that climate solutions are ineffective is the argument that solving climate change is too hard. Either way, the purpose is to argue that we shouldn't act on climate change. It's all about delaying or preventing climate policy. The third category of solutions misinformation is the argument that climate policies are harmful. Arguments that climate policies are harmful mostly focus on how climate policies increase costs. These claims tend to cherry pick aspects of the policy to make them look as bad as possible. For example, looking at how a price on carbon raises electricity prices while ignoring how the extra revenue will be given back to lower income households. A key element to solving climate change is transitioning to renewable energy sources like solar and wind power. Consequently, these forms of energy have been criticized as being ineffective or harmful. If you have a windmill anywhere near your house, congratulations, your house just went down 75% in value. <laughs> and they say the noise causes cancer. You tell me that one, okay? <laughs> you know, the thing makes it so... And of course, it's like a graveyard for birds. The last category of solutions denial is justifying fossil fuels because the world needs energy. This is often ironically framed as concern for the poor, while ignoring that more vulnerable communities and developing countries are typically the ones most impacted by climate change. The more carbon-based fuels you can introduce in the developing world, Africa, South America, Asia, the cleaner the environment gets. You have less people burning dung in their huts. It's immoral to act if it isn't going to make much difference, if it makes it harder for poor people to live. If it raises the price of energy, that really hurts people. Often this argument emphasizes that fossil fuel energy is more affordable. This argument is fast becoming obsolete, as in many cases, renewables are becoming cheaper than fossil fuels. To reiterate, there are five key climate beliefs. Five major themes if you're explaining climate change to people. It's real. It's us. Experts agree on these first two points. It's bad. But there's hope. We can solve climate change. But the people opposing climate action try to counter this with five categories of misinformation. It's not real. It's not us. Experts are unreliable. It's not bad and there's no hope. Misinformation can cancel out accurate information. So understanding and responding to climate denial is crucial if we want to increase climate literacy and build support for climate action.